Thank you very much, Jan. I want to thank the University of Antwerp who invited me here and, to, and my students who have made this a very, um, a very enjoyable semester. Um, I will um, speak in English and then I'll speak the discussion further in Netherlands. Okay. Um, you know, when we think of interreligious dialogue, Right, or Jewish, Judeo, Jewish Christian interreligious dialogue, often what comes to mind is either um, uh, philosophers or authors who have engaged the topic in their writings, the Golden Age in Spain, more unfortunate power circumstances such as the disputations uh, later on, um, or very often today, um, these Judeo-Christian interreligious encounters um, take place as a kind of, um, I would say, um, a branch of, um, uh, of diplomacy. People meet at um, uh, conferences or they meet very often in formal settings under the eye of a non-committed non public in order to um, sit, stand or very often sit in front of their tags upon which they have titles that require them to be representatives or ambassadors of Judaism, of Christianity for the other. And um, while there may be some value in this, particularly if they're also linked to solving intercommunal problems, um, I want to speak tonight over uh, about another kind of encounter in which Jews and Christians meet each other and conduct dialogue without necessarily being formal representatives of or without having met expressly for the purpose of conducting dialogue. And what I'll be speaking of is the case of um, Christian Holy Land tours, Christian pilgrimages to Israel, Palestine, in which um, Jewish guides serve as their mediators, as their guides, as the narrators, not only of the land, but also very often of Judaism and of Christianity. So I'm looking at Holy Land pilgrimage as a kind of juncture of theology and interactive lived experience. And the contribution I hope to offer tonight resolves from the ethnographic detail that was acquired through 30 years practically in which I worked as a licensed Jewish-Israeli tour guide from Christian, for Christian pilgrims of a variety of countries and denominations, as well as interviews that I conducted with other guides working with other groups, other languages, uh, in order to examine and to hear about their own experiences and performances as interreligious or as religious mediators. Now, Christian pilgrimage was often explained to, with reference to Christian theology or leadership or models of ethical behavior. And most pilgrims who come to the Holy Land voyage to keep their eyes on Jesus, to confirm their faith rather than to challenge it. The close, the groups that they travel in, and most pilgrims um, to Israel today come in organized groups rather than as individuals, um, are fairly closed. In other words, they're the extent of their encounter with Israelis or with Palestinians outside the bubble of the tour bus and the tour package is fairly limited. And these kinds of um, group closed groups, on the one hand, may be a kind of transfer of their home community traveling around somewhere else in the Middle East, but also the fact that they are detached from most of their worries of daily life um, allows a sense of community to develop there, what the anthropologist Victor Turner called, named as communitas, 
in which the other becomes a brother. In other words, some of the social hierarchies that are there in daily life can be dissolved because they're all standing in the same position or traveling in the same position and going through many of the same experiences faced with some uh, kind of higher spiritual power uh, um, within this bubble. So, um, but when they come, and they come as a Christian group, even if they are expressly coming to confirm their faith, they find that there are others that have somehow infiltrated inside the bubble without their knowing it. In this case, it can be the Jewish-Israeli tour guide and, though I won't speak of him much here, um, the very often the Palestinian Christian or Palestinian Muslim bus driver who accompany these groups for the period of usually eight to ten days in which they travel through the Holy Land. And what I want to do more this evening is to focus on the guide, and I suggest that if we view the guide not simply as a facilitator or a secondary kind of touristic element of the voyage, but as an integral part of the pilgrimage, we can come to understand Christian Holy Land pilgrimage as an interreligious experience. So, the Jewish guide, the Jewish-Israeli guide, brings his Judaism to the encounter. And this Judaism often confronts pilgrims and poses questions, even if it's not part of their itinerary or part of their prior expectations. Furthermore, um, in this liminal but highly charged space of the land of Israel, right, the Jewish-Israeli guides often become caught up in the performances that they do and encounter. That is, that the performance of Christianity leaks into the everyday life and influences Israeli guides' Jewish identity as well. And I want to provide illustrations of that. Before I do that, I should note that the framing of Holy Land pilgrimage as Judeo-Christian encounter is not new. Throughout history, many who claim fidelity to eternal values have done so in conditions of friction with other believers that contest those claims. And in the case of Judaism, Yisrael Yuval has shown how many of the things that are considered as deeply rooted Jewish traditions, such as many elements of the Passover Seder, are actually part of a very old Judeo-Christian polemic. Right? to saying this is not what Christians do, so we'll do that at a distance. For example, the suppression of almost all of references to sacrifice in the Passover Seder, or the breaking of the Afikoman bread and others. Orally more, in the case of uh, Holy Land pilgrimage, documents how Jews became unwilling witnesses to Christian truth in Byzantine pilgrims accounts. Jews' authority as natives and as bearers of scripture and prophecy made their identification of Christian holy sites and, through, and, um, and truths authentic, especially if they didn't believe them. So that in the 5th, 6th century in particular, right, Jews were the authenticators saying this is the true tomb of Jesus because they were to, they, they had brought them on their pilgrimage when they came there. Jews living in Jerusalem on their pilgrimage were brought and they would confirm the sites and you see this has to be the truth because he doesn't believe in Jesus before but in spite of that he says that this is the place. So you have this interreligious contact that's part of Christian pilgrimage from the very beginning, although it's very rarely thematized and given much attention. So um, I want to illustrate how the shared relation to the land right, charges relations between Jewish guide and Christian group, while it may so it may confirm the identities of each as Jews and as Christians. But it also may enable each, I think, like supercharged atomic particles that the charge of the land allows them to escape the gravitational pull of their own preconceptions and attain something new through the encounter. I'll begin now, before I go into the details of how this works, to outline the frame of contemporary Holy Land guided pilgrimages 
And the paradox entailed in that Jewish guides are mediating Christian sacra for Christian pilgrims. I'll then provide several examples of practices of Jewish Israeli guides that illustrate the productive nature of the Jewish Christian encounter, mainly as it's viewed and processed by the guides, including the slippages in performance, where the guide performances leak out of the frame of the tour and into their off-stage, off-microphone lives of the guides. And among the questions I will illustrate are, what can we learn about the ways that pilgrimage experiences work and how they link place, text, emotion, and embodied experience? What does pilgrimage tell us about relations between Judaism and Christianity? And how we may, may we understand the roles of pilgrim guides as cultural mediators and how those performances come to shape their own identities as Jewish Israelis. And then at the end, if there's time, I'll offer just some general suggestions on what some of the parameters are of this encounter, which I believe can be applied to other interfaith encounters as well, not necessarily on pilgrimage. Okay. I need to tell you a little bit about the frame of how these pilgrimages work. Right. What happens on them? How are they set up? Okay. So most pilgrims come on 8 to 15 day tours along with their pastor or priest. And if in general, in tourist trips, the principal expectation of tourists from professional guides is that they provide information and interpretation, in pilgrim groups, the pastoral leader often plays a major interpretive role through his readings and sermons. So there's not one leader or one guide essentially, but two. A pastor or priest who comes with them and a local guide who takes them around. Yeah. Um, the pastoral leader plays a major part of his interpretive role through his readings, his prayers, and his sermons. And the knowledge that pilgrims request most is not facts, but knowledge that augments their faith experience. If I speak in evangelical terms, the head of the leader and guide are valued as a tool for reaching the heart. The group's itineraries focus on sites of significance to Christian faith and history, and are often advertised as a walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Pilgrims conduct regular Christian worship, read Bible passages, and sing hymns in the course of their visit. The pilgrims inhabit an environmental bubble which intensifies interaction within the group while protecting the group from most direct contact with the surrounding environment. Also important because we're speaking mainly of uh, pilgrims 50 to 75 years old and very often with a kind of Orientalist fear of what's around them in, in the Middle East, supplemented by what they've heard on the news broadcasts. So the tour guide is often the only local person that they talk with, and perhaps the driver as well. So besides being seen as a native Israeli, although I'm American born, as a Jew, I was marked by pilgrims in certain emotionally charged ways. Besides being people of the book, bearers of memory, and natives who possess geographical and scriptural knowledge, Jews become witnesses and authenticators of Christian sites and truths. And whatever Christian pilgrims' views of Israel and Jews are, they are rarely indifferent. So they bring that with them. As frequently as the case in commodified tourism, visitors' image of the country and its inhabitants, which are at variance with daily realities on the ground, create pressure on the part of local guides and service workers to comply with tourist images. So unlike, say, in many, the stage of lecturing for a class, where it's possible to say, you know, I really didn't like that professor, but I learned a good deal from him. Uh, in tourism, in the pilgrimage uh, situation, the, your pilgrims are the clients, and the guides are the, the, the pilgrims have come to strengthen their faith, but also to have a good time, very rarely to be challenged. And um, the expression of that, their satisfaction for most guides comes in the form of larger tips and requests to guide future groups. So 
um, a guide will rarely want to say something that will displease um, the pilgrims that he has or challenge their faith, especially if he's not sure he can get away with it. So the structure of the guided tours uh, place the Jewish guide in the position of a narrator between Christian pilgrims and the Bible, Jesus and the holy places, but in ways where he has to test out very often the waters and see what pilgrims are ready to handle, what pilgrims are ready to digest. For example, um, you can tell a joke that's related to Christianity, but you'd better try it out on the pastor or priest first. If he laughs and he says tells them, then that's probably okay. If he makes a terrible face, then you know, well, forget about this. <laughs> the third possibility is that, oh, that's a great joke, don't tell them. So he can tell them afterwards. <laughs> now, many of the groups I worked with were evangelical Protestants, primarily because there's a large American market and because my first language is English. And they come to the Bible land with a partially unconscious set of expectations of what to see and how the land should look, right? And the Jewish-Israeli guide, even one who has never spent any time in the States, is well positioned to create a Bible land that corresponds to Protestant preconceptions, I'll explain. For Catholic groups, the authority of their accompanying priest is very much vested in sacraments and manifested, even if not exclusively, through performed liturgy. In Protestant groups, the authority of spiritual leaders is intimately linked to their performance of the biblical word. And as a true Hebrew, the guide is granted speaking rights and reading rights to the word. So, if the guide reads from the Bible and reads from it with intonations that correspond to the ways, for example, that evangelicals are used to reading the Bible, then their expectation is that he's one of them. Whereas with a Catholic group, the one thing that the guide cannot and should not do is to perform the Mass. And that is extremely important in the status of the priest in separating, distinguishing between, between us and, and them. So, many, furthermore, many Protestant presuppositions are ingrained in the Zionist narrative that shapes the guide's training and habitus. The historically intertwined Protestant Zionist relationship has engendered shared social memory practices of viewing, classifying, History, classifying history and orientalizing. And these rely on shared mythic discourses that maintain authorized meanings and promote ways of making and experiencing sanctified spaces. So, when one trains in Israel, both in the guide course and when Israelis go on Yediat Haaretz, travels through the land as part of their school training, one of the things that was done, that is done sometimes and was done much, is to go to places that have biblical significance, to read the passage, to read the passage there out loud, and then say, you see that over there? You see that hill? That's where Deborah stood. That's where she gathered her forces. There's where the Canaanites, of, and now let's read, and the rain came down. This works perfectly with Protestant pilgrims because they, what they do very often is to look at the place, to follow the finger on your right, on your left, look as it's written in Zechariah. You see that? Okay. Catholic groups, especially from Southern Europe, can go an entire pilgrimage for two weeks and practically never go up to a panoramic point. They don't need to. They can go out of the bus, go quickly out, run into the Holy Sepulchre, and then prostrate themselves on the stone, and they're there. There's a kind of way of touching and experiencing that's moved through the land through liturgy, rather than being moved through the land by having their fingers pointed out and relating back all the time to the text. That bowing down with the liturgy is fairly difficult or inaccessible for guides, whereas the performance here of the text and say, you see this, is exactly what Israelis learn as part of their school education and what guides learn when they're taught how to perform the Holy Land and how to make the land accessible for the groups that they guide. So an Israeli grows up in, in 
born and grows up in Israel, goes through school, goes through the guide course, finishes the guide course, steps off, walks onto a bus of Protestant pilgrims, and lo and behold, the way that he describes the land, the way that he uses panoramas, is exactly what the Protest these Protestants expect to see, certainly if you conclude the New Testament as well as the Old as part of your narrative. Right? And as a result, many guides and others think that it's natural that this is the way to see the land. It's not. It has to do with the way that guiding and the way that looking at the land developed out of a common Protestant tradition of the 19th century and was taken up by Zionism as the way of mapping the land, as the way of learning and walking and guiding through the land, and that's why it meshes so tightly. But that means that the Israeli guide, Jewish Israeli guides, even if they don't have the same political opinions as their group, have something that seems natural to them, which will speak to the Protestant groups and which will enable them, their narrative to be heard and absorbed easily. Um, so these ways tie the, uh, these overlapping Zionist and Protestant narratives cement both guide and group to the land and to each other, while in many cases it will result in marginalizing Palestinian Arabs and Muslims that can be for many overlooked because they're following Jesus and the Bible, and these things are often extraneous, so one doesn't need to talk about them, but often they're not part of the essential picture. I'll now provide several examples of guiding performances for Christians that are based on interviews with tour guides, as well as my own guiding experience. And hopefully each of them will focus on another facet of this encounter. So the first guide I'll, I'll, I will cite to you is a man who I'll call Roberto, he's Italian, and he tells the following account, I'm quoting. From the outset, I felt that my home was more in Jerusalem than in Italy. It's such a unique place, an enchanting place. The people in Israel interested me, and Judaism interests me intellectually. For me, Judaism is morality and the direct connection to God. I don't need anyone to be my mediator. I don't need the shepherd with his staff. My father was a Christian, and my mother was Jewish, so I lived in the Christian world my entire life. Whoever grew up as I did in an Italian village with few Jews and went to Mass to pray, whoever grew up that way has a special understanding of things. He knows what the Christian has in his head. Until 30 years ago, the Vatican prohibited the study of Judaism and the Hebrew Bible. The Italian Christians date back 2,000 years and don't know who Jesus was, what a Jew is. The common people don't link up to the intellectual theories, so when they arrive here in Israel, we construct their knowledge in their language and in their mentality, and that's a great accomplishment. I prepare them a picnic on the Mount of Beatitudes, where you see the entire lake. People get high from that. I prepare them sandwiches and fruit. I read to them from the Hebrew Bible after I've led them to understand the story from the land, and then when I read from the Hebrew Bible, they react with, there's an element of mission in guiding in Israel. It's not a vacation, but an experience. And I believe that contributing to knowledge is contributing towards peace. I chose Judaism, and it's the best thing I've done in my life, and I have no regrets, not the shadow of a doubt. I chose, and I'm at peace, so I can live with others and have no reason to fear. Many Italian guides don't, Jewish Italian guides, he means, don't go into churches, and in their position they transmit that they don't want to get dirty. I go inside and provide the complimentary Jewish part to the priest's words, if the priest agrees, of course. Every Christian is also a Jew, he just doesn't know it, but when he gets here, he discovers that. End of Roberto's. So Roberto sees his performance as a mission. It's his way of placing Judaism at the center of Italian Christian's map. He can do so at the Sea of Galilee as a native son of Israel, as an elder brother of Christianity, in ways that he could never do as a Jew in the Italian town of his youth. By preparing the meal, overlooking the lake, he claims the role of the host. If you like, he is the one multiplying the loaves and fishes and feeding the multitude at the lakeside. What's more, at the open landscape of the Sea of Galilee, and not, let's say, inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, 
he is able to do so. He has speaking rights. The performance reaffirms the correctness of Roberto's own faith commitment. He said, I chose Judaism and it's the best thing I've done in my life. And this practice is a kind of reaffirmation and as well as an expression of that commitment. The second story. Gila. Some guides get caught up in the pilgrim performance to the extent that they undergo Christian religious experiences which they describe as being beyond their control. Gila, a native-born Israeli in her 40s, relates, With the Mormons, I participated in their confessions and sometimes shared personal experience with them, but did not participate in communion except a few times abroad when I went with them to their neighborhood church. During their prayers in church, I prayed to God in my heart and asked forgiveness if I was committing a sin towards him. I divided myself between outside and inside. When I was working with the Mormons, I had visions of Jesus. Once a woman appeared to me in a dream. She said she was coming especially to me to give her testimony that Jesus was God. In the dream about Jesus, which was very scary, I saw a scene like that of the creation. There was darkness and suddenly light began to appear. I felt that God was going to appear to me. I saw angels who came down from the sky and knew that in a moment he was going to appear to me and I was paralyzed with fear. Suddenly I saw a boat and in it a figure half lying down, half seated. I understood that God was Jesus and the boat was on the Sea of Galilee. Then it was over. The dream really upset me. This happened in Israel when I wasn't working, but at a time when I worked a lot with Christians. I'm still quoting them. Apparently it was the influence of the New Testament stories. It made me think that maybe it's a hint that I should convert or recognize Jesus as part of my religion. I told this to my husband and also to a group of Mormons in the course of their emotional confessions. They were very moved and hugged me. Now, the guide's involvement with Christian groups as guide then spills over into visits with Mormon communities abroad who invite her to come, into attendance at their church ceremonies, and relations of confidence and intimacy with Mormon pilgrims and culminates in visions of Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. Although in the end the guide does not convert, she relates that she seriously considered doing so. So another kind of <coughs> she might being caught up, right, and spilling into beyond the guide, the, the guided tour. A third story, okay, someone I'll call Richard. Richard, a veteran guide and professor of religion, is hired primarily to guide theological groups and those that are interested in Jewish-Christian relations. Pastors and priests who, priests who request his services often provide him with a mandate to challenge the beliefs of group members. He fashions the tour around four extended spiritual lessons, an hour or an hour and a half each, at four mountains important in scripture, including the Mount of Beatitudes, sort of Carmel and the Mount of Beatma, Carmel, Mount of Beatitudes, uh, Mount of Olives, and, and, and Calvary. He recounts, there's sometimes a heated argument on the Mount of Beatitudes because I present them with a Jesus they do not know. A Jesus who demands, who is more demanding than God of the First Testament, the Hebrew Bible. He demands that you be perfect, and if you're not, then you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. I say that what he teaches on the Mount of Beatitudes is important. It is important to be a complete human being in impulses and actions. It is important to be present. So what good is his forgiveness? What does it help if I find myself in paradise if I'm still divided and incomplete? That's what the argument is about. If it succeeds, we end the trip with the sense of having achieved a link with our most important questions. They say something like, to me, they say something like, you may not understand why, but you deepened our faith. All the themes of the trip join up to a single experience together. It includes understanding, but not just an intellectual understanding. It's an understanding of our entire being. I make it a point to ask them how they feel about me as a Jew who does not believe in Jesus reading to them from their holy book. But the fact is, I tell them, it is a book that I take very seriously in my searching and it's in that spirit, I tell them, that I read it to you. 
If I were a Christian, I couldn't tell them all the things I do, because then I would be part of the club. Not all participants appreciate. Some would rather be soothed and confirmed in the faith they brought into the trip. Some would rather have less explanation and questioning and more time to meditate in silence. Some write me after the tour that they pray for me that I find Jesus. <laughs> this disgusts me. I think that it's something like, we're the winners, we've got the answer. When they were with me, they didn't have answers. But it doesn't matter. Let them find Jesus and everything will be all right. We are forgiven, they say. If there's an attempt on the part of the group to make me into a Christian, I tell them, I'm with Christians a lot. If I felt that their relationships were those of openness, that they had a better quality of life than others, I would join. But I don't see it. I don't see a community of perfect people. I see people with the same worries, problems, and complexes as others. I tell them that in Judaism, the Messiah is someone who brings salvation, redemption. Jesus was here and the world hasn't improved much. Sometimes I would feel their adrenaline mounting, and I said, good, that's the way it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus was here in the synagogue, and some left the synagogue. And now it's a good time to eat St. Peter's fish. Who in their surroundings talks with them that way? Here, in this account, Richard's own intellectual and spiritual search for authenticity, combined with his position as a Jewish, Israeli, American, insider, outsider, enable him to present a Judeo-Christian synthesis quite different from what many pilgrims are used to hearing. But this is only possible because of Richard's willingness to give up work rather than compromise his truth, and the desire of certain pastors to use Richard's liminal status in order to challenge the complacency of their congregants' faith. I can't do it because I've got to deal with the trustees back home, but you can, so you challenge them. And therefore, is enough support on the part of the pastors in order to go ahead and to challenge them in his, uh, in his explanation. One other case. Okay. Bernice, a, a Francophone Holocaust child survivor, an Orthodox Jewish guide in her, Orthodox Jewish guide in her 60s, relates. I am Jewish, born and raised, but I had an interruption. When I was hidden during World War II, I learned Christianity. We were in hiding with my parents, living in a small village in France as a Christian family. I went to school and learned religion. It was very interesting. My grandmother made sure I would learn well, but every Sunday before Mass would whisper in my ear in Yiddish, Don't forget you were Jewish. In the beginning, Francine says, Christianity was in competition with Judaism. The borders between Christianity and Judaism were unclear, so there was a need to separate, so to show that the Jews don't have the truth. It's written black on white that the Jews must be preserved, but only in a state of humiliation that attests to Christian truth that Judaism is passé. Like the Germans who prohibited Jews from going to the bathhouse and then said that the Jews are dirty and smelly. I tried to make the pilgrims understand that instead of humiliating the Jews and saying they were punished, they can observe their religion in peace. But I also tried to transmit that Christianity is one of the three monotheistic religions, although it's not so monotheistic. I tell them that the worship of Isis persisted very late in the Roman Empire, and the only way to deal with it was to dress her up in a blue robe and call her Mary, Mother of Jesus. The pilgrims sincerely believe that they worship one God. When the Creator created man, he placed, him, he placed in him a spark of divinity. That's how we come to a recognition of the Creator. If we're lucky and we're born to the Jewish people, we're closer to the source. I want to transmit the message that people will understand what Judaism really is. I want to show them the Jewish sources of their faith. To show them the history of their religion in its natural setting. To show how Christianity separated from Judaism and why. I think they separated when they wanted to bring the principles of Judaism, monotheism, to the larger world. They couldn't bring it with all the restrictions of keeping the commandments. It was impossible for the masses. But if you say that all you have to do is believe in Jesus and you're saved, it's easier than having to observe 613 commandments. So Bernice. Yet, 
her aim of purifying Christianity of idolatry, in her words, must face the expectations of the pilgrims and those of the itinerary. She tells us, One woman asked me, when we came out of the Holy Sepulchre, if Israelis did archaeological excavations and found bones. I asked her, What do you expect of me as a Jew to ask to answer you as a devout Christian? You believe that, Christ, that Jesus was resurrected and ascended to heaven. So she said, All right, I didn't think about that. <laughs> so Bernice, as a Jew and Israeli, is asked to play the role of witness to Christian truth by providing archaeological evidence. She replies by distancing herself from shared community, I as a devout Jew, you as a devout Christian, she says, while correcting a doctrinal, doctrinal error in the pilgrim's Christianity, you're supposed to believe he went up to heaven and so there are no bones to find. Her, provi her provision of this perform consummate performance for the Christians in the church, which involves a concealment, or at least a silencing, of her own doubt or disbelief, does <coughs> take its toll, however. She tells us, After a day of churches, it's a pleasure to take a shower. I have the feeling that some kind of impurity weighs upon me. In addition, there's the thing that almost all the churches I know of are built on sites of idolatry, and in fact, they continue to worship idols. So Bernice says, but if we look at what she says, the matter is far more complex. What she summarizes, she said, they worship idols, but it's because of that idolatrous belief that I and my family are alive today. And it may be that these contradictions, the moral rectitude of the Christians that she was hidden by and she worked with, and idolatry, the aesthetic attraction of some of the churches and the need to maintain her allegiance to Judaism even while in the church, to Orthodox Judaism even while in the church, the difficulties of dissimulation in order to survive during the war, it seems that these continue to play out and play out again every time Bernice decides that she's going to guide another Christian group. And a final example. Okay. In my own guiding work, I would often quote from the New Testament and employ intonations that were familiar to evangelicals in my explanations. Although I took care not to refer to Jesus as Messiah or our Lord and Savior, repeatedly I found my position misunderstood. Participants would ask me, so when did you discover Jesus? Theological explanations on Jewish messianic beliefs rarely made a difference. The same questions and the same testimony on their behalf would continue. To borrow evangelical terms, for them, if I wasn't born again yet, by talking the talk, I had demonstrated that I had come under conviction. So, after a few of these tours, I tried ritual. On the day of our visits to the Western Wall, I packed my talit and tefillin, prayer shawl and phylacteries in my backpack. When we arrived at the plaza in front of the wall, I wrapped myself in the talit, recited the blessings in Hebrew, wound the tefillin around my arm, and translated the accompanying prayer text to them. As the group photographed me, while looking at the similar, similarly attired worshippers at the wall, I sensed the coin dropping, ah, he's not one of us. Even for evangelicals, ritual did the trick. It marked the border, and afterwards they would ask me, so what do you Jews think of Jesus? That was an improvement. <laughs> After a year or so of these talit and tefillin performances at the wall, I reconsidered. At age 16, my father gave me hell for not putting on tefillin for prayer each morning. Your father put on tefillin, your grandfather wore tefillin, your cousins all wear tefillin, only you, no good family. I refused to wear the tefillin to please my father. Was I now going to put them on to please the goyim? <laughs> the religious context of the performance at the Western Wall, at prayer time, like, that, uh, like the, what the worshippers at the Wall were doing, left little room for role distance. Was I not saying to them, and ultimately to myself, that this is what real Jews do? How then would I explain if I asked why I didn't put on tefillin every day without appearing irreverent in their eyes? I think the interaction here is a kind of a, a, a tango across, with symbols across religious lines. 
The ritual worked in defining an effective order between myself as Jew and the group as Christians because the context was perceived as religious and worthy of respect, especially since the prayer text I recited and translated referred to verses that are part of their Bible as well. Because donning the talit and tefillin and reciting the prayer could be seen as an act of commitment, which in many ways it is, they might then expect me to behave as orthodox in order to be authentically Jewish in their eyes. So the self-essentialization, especially given my own decision not to wear tefillin each morning, made me uncomfortable. So the tourist or pilgrim gaze on the religious symbols changes their nature for myself as performer as well as perhaps for them. As the group's gaze moves from the leather straps on my arm to those worn by the Hasidim praying closer to the wall, what do they see? Do they reclassify me as an outsider? Have the Hasidim now become less strange? Or maybe the onlookers come to appreciate that Jesus wore straps like these and was in fact far more Jewish than they had imagined previously? As in the case of many natives' representations of their culture to outsiders, the tourists' or pilgrims' interpretation of the symbols of the guide can never be co fully controlled by the performers. Something always slips beyond. So, to conclude, pilgrimage practices and stories are part of an ongoing struggle among actors who seek to appropriate space and remake the world in their own images. And such practices often draw on deeply ingrained, if often acknowledged, historical images and practices like the outlook points. And while Jewish guides may go a long way in accommodating the beliefs and practices of Christian pilgrims who are their customers, their clients, they may also act out themes of theology or belief, power or revenge through their performances, as sometimes in the case of uh, Bernice's offstage showers to purify herself. Yet Jewish Israeli guides may also be seduced by the Christianity of the pilgrim groups they lead and get caught up in their own seductive performances. The result may be um, either self-essentialization in Christian terms or very often defense mechanisms that are put up in order to avoid the dangers of conversion or slipping over the border. So, Guiding practices that they develop to deal with Christian groups may be incorporated into longer narratives of their own long-term Jewish identity, like Roberto feeding right, the pilgrims at the Mount of Beatitudes, where he becomes the host and, the brother, if you like, the brother of Jesus. The Jewish-Christian encounter of guiding is a highly charged one, and notwithstanding guides' efforts to maintain the boundaries of pilgrimage and kind of peel off their masks at the end of the day, the guiding performances often leak into everyday life. For example, um, I know when I was working a good deal with uh, Christian pilgrims and reading, uh, my daughter was just growing up, and I would recite her uh, a Tanakh story every day before bedtime. And once I came back from a group, and I was really exhausted, and I was trying to think, we'd already gone all the way through Jeremiah, and what am I going to tell her now? And so I started to tell her a story of Jesus at the lakeside. And then about, after about three minutes, I kind of stopped myself and said, OK, that's enough. Good night. And decided, I don't want to tell her this story as one of Daddy's stories. I'd like her to read that when she's old enough on her own. But I don't want to be part of the same complex that are charged with the same emotional charge. But the slippage was very easy to do because I had the entire day been reading or reading out loud biblical passages, whether they be Old or New Testament, for the sake of pilgrims, and then you come back and you simply can't say, okay, pilgrims over, family now, peel off the mask and put on another persona. These things leak and in all sorts of ways. So, um, I, I want to suggest that coming back to the beginning of interfaith encounters, in all of this Judeo-Christian encounter, I really spoke very little about theology and much more about performance. And I want to suggest that interfaith encounters, not only on pilgrimage, may be better understood if we, keep, if we pay a lot of attention to the performative frames in which they take place. Okay. Here are, are some of the things that I want to think about, and perhaps they're applicable to other, other cases of interfaith encounter. 
To what extent are the speaking rights of leaders shaped by theological values? What can the non-believer or which one say and get away with? How does the particular Christian orientation of the group determine the speaking rights of the non-Christian opposite of them based on their religious or perhaps even ethnic identity? And what's the theological basis for the accompanying religious authority? What role does the spoken discourse have in the religious <coughs> world of the pilgrims? That may be important in saying what can accomplish, what can be accomplished through speech, as opposed, say, to ritual that may not always be shared. What things can they what things will people say or refuse to say as a result of their religious commitments? When I observed more recently a Spanish Catholic group, I was struck by the way um, that um, none of them in a group of 30, including many religious nuns and priests, uh, had a Bible or a text in their hand and would entirely follow the liturgy that swept them through from one place to another. Uh, the priest who served as their guide, there was no Israeli guide, it was the priest from Spanish priest, Catholic priest, who served as their guide, would every so often read, but never holding a Bible in hand, just open the guidebook to whatever passage and read the quote there. And I thought for a minute, wait, I could do that. And then he got to the end of the passage and closed and said, Palabra de Dios, the word of God. I said, that I can't do. So this authority of the priest in terms of what is the sacrament that is vested in him spills over to the authority he has in reading the word. So it's not the intonation. It's not the biblical knowledge that is most important. Certainly not the geographical knowledge, which in his case was, was fairly weak, but the fact that he can lead them through and be the priest leading the liturgy and the spokesman reading from the Bible at the same time that are invested in the same body, and thus they'll follow them through, they'll follow his voice, even if they have no idea what biblical passage it happens to be, because that's not what's important. The liturgy will carry them through. The second thing are the question of pre-existing knowledge. How much in interfaith encounters does each party know about the other? And to what extent is that knowledge desired? And how does the value of this knowledge differ for, in this case, the pilgrim, the spiritual leader, and the local mediators? How much challenge to belief are various actors willing to tolerate and in what circumstances? Um, and then there's the social dimension that often are ignored in terms of what is the, if you like, the theater of the encounter. How dense is the social network among pilgrims or among people who are listening to these interfaith encounters or participating? How far do they rally behind right, the authority of a person who's there as the spokesman of, quote, of their religion? How tightly are they drawn together how much have they undergone preparation together? Do they have a prior commitment to some kind of explicit doctrine? To what extent are they interested in these encounters in manifesting group boundaries through the discourse? And what is it that holds them together? Is it liturgy, desire for merit or forgiveness, the personality of a charismatic leader? Um, age and gender? The host-guest encounter, what territory does it take place? Right. Are there locals and hosts? Think back on Roberto, the same encounter that he could take, have, perform at the Sea of Galilee, he would never dream of doing in the village where he grew up in Italy. This is very much a chad ha'am, the idea that a call in order for, for Jewish culture in order to develop in full autonomy, it needs the framework of an independent state so that one is not constantly being shaped by an outside lens. There on the Sea of Galilee, by providing food, he is being the host and saying, welcome, you may be looking for Jesus, he's in my home, on my territory, and I'm the host providing you here with food. Right. Um, who are the people who are doing Are they locals? Are they foreigners, priests, or laymen? Are they Western, Oriental, Israeli, or Palestinian? How much do locals need to conform to pilgrims' expectations religiously and culturally in order for a productive dialogue to take place? Is there financial dependence right, in such cases or otherwise? Right? It's not only in guides, 
There are professional dialogian, dialogians who have in mind what they're going to say in order to be invited to the next encounter and the next attractive place. How much does it, what are the possibilities for long-term long relationships outside of the ritual encounter, whether it be pilgrimage or the interplace of interfaith, interfaith dialogue? What about trust? Right? How much trust can be developed previous to these dialogues or these encounters? In the case of pilgrimage, um, there's a kind of intimacy that allows pilgrims to place, place trust in guides or other leaders um, ir irrespective of previous categorizations. So there may be a great deal of suspicion on the first day, but after five days, after seven days, there's a kind of relaxing, a kind of establishment of trust that's done through all kinds of ways that allows people to open up. And these things need to be taken into account in interfaith dialogues where very often the formality of the setting precludes the establishment of trust, that along with television broadcasting and the, and the very often the, the presence of a, a neutral but spectator audience that forces people to essentialize themselves in their roles. What may arouse violent contention on the first day of the pilgrimage tour may be accepted by the eighth as mutual trust goes, grows. Right? or because pastors or priests already know the guides and can vouch for them and encourage people to say, oh, don't worry about him, he's fine, you know, he has a, even if he's not Christian, but he has a heart for the Lord. Okay. And this mutual confidence is particularly important in pilgrimage because very often the narratives involve a kind of winking, I would say, or collaboration between the guide and the spiritual leader, not only in revealing things, but in hiding them. So, the priest, as well as the guide, may know that the upper room, <coughs> where the Pentecostals have had a wonderful experience of speaking in tongues, was built by the Crusaders in the 13th century. Or, that the garden tomb in which people come back, Protestant pilgrims come back and say, here's where they really felt the presence of the Lord was invented by General Gordon in the 19th century. But it would be better both for the pastor and for the guide not to put this up front before they go to their service or even immediately afterwards. So there often is a collusion there between the pastor or the priest and the guide that goes over the head of some of the um, uh, faithful of the flock. So, right, this trust placed in the guide or, and the, in the leader is a very important in saying what is one empowered to say. Okay. And perhaps towards the end, the power of place, right? The Holy Land is not a neutral stage for these interfaith encounters. It's charged with history for Jews and Christians. And, although I haven't spoken of it here, for Israelis, Palestinians, and Westerners, and certain places, spaces facilitate certain interfaith reactions, whereas others don't. So the Sea of Galilee as a nature space, which is both the theater of Jesus' mission, as well as the Israeli pioneering landscape, enables a variety of border crossing performances from Israeli dreams of Jesus to Jewish performances of the multiplication of loaves by Roberto, whereas the Holy Sepulchre, for example, a closed space, filled with Christian symbols and liturgy, certainly does not enable those sorts of interfaith performances. And of course, all these parameters don't have the same importance in all circumstances. Um, and while I spoke here of the guide and of the priest, what I haven't spoken of very much is what are the various pilgrims' reactions to these performances, which can be contested, rarely are done so openly, or the pilgrims can be somewhere else entirely while these exchanges are going on. A colleague of mine wrote a book, uh, Hilary Kale, called Walking in the Footsteps of Jesus, and employed a very different methodology. She went and she entered, she prepared, went during the preparations of, the, of groups of American women, uh, 50 to 75 years old, before their trip, sat in the back with the women during their trip, and then came back and interviewed people of the group during the period of a month and even a year or more afterwards. 
And what she wrote surprised me, even though these were probably many of the same groups, or same kinds of groups that I had guided. Because she said that, let's call her Mildred, in the, back, in the tenth seat of the tenth row of the bus, said, well, you know, the guide is giving all this, you know, history and geography and political explanation. That's fine, but I'm not really interested in that. And the pa our pastor is doing, you know, is giving a sermon, and they're fine, but I can hear him next week when I go back to church. What I'm concerned with is wherever I go, I'm praying for my sister that she recover from cancer, or I'm, I'm looking every spot that I go to shop for the olive wood carving of Jesus the carpenter that I can give to my grandson and that he will see valuable enough to take with him to college when he goes away and that will keep him on the right track. She could have been sitting on my bus and I would never know, right? Because I don't hear her. She's a voice that's muted in the back and only by sitting back there do we realize and are we also humbled enough to, re to realize that the guide the pastor, and perhaps the people making their voices known, voices heard on the front of the bus, parentheses, most of them men, right? uh, are those that I see as reflecting right, the pattern of the, of the tour and the pilgrimage and what it does. And it does, it does so for the various guides. But it may very well be Right? that something else is happening there in the back of the bus that try as I may that, I'm not, that, that I and others are not aware of. So I hope that through this I've been able to focus attention on the role of spiritual mediators and on the, the interactions that underlie the pilgrimage uh, and their interreligious potential even if, or perhaps especially if, they remain below the threshold of consciousness of many of the participants. Thank you very much.